Hello, everybody, and welcome to the HTML All The Things podcast, episode number six, Planning and Working on Projects. I'm your host, Matt Lawrence, and I'm joined again by my co-host, Mike Coran. What have you been up to this week, Mike? Uh, it's been kind of a busy week for me. I've just been doing a lot of client work, um, lots of meetings, trying to plan that, and then, you know, got my own life going on. So it's been tough to get any uh, HTML All The Things stuff done, but, uh, I mean, client work is good, too. So what about you, Matt? Just uh, kind of the same thing, really been working, really been grinding on the client work. I've been like kind of touching on the the Vue.js stuff that we had reviewed before because we really need to get the actual site up for this. So I'll be doing that hopefully when the client work uh, kind of goes down. But that, that's kind of the point, I guess, of the of the podcast is to sort of ground us so that we have like an anchor every week so that, you know, you have a goal every week. At least you get the podcast out in between doing all the client work and everything else, right? So... Yeah, for sure. Um, so as always, we have a packed show for you this week, and I'm just going to go through the segments as, as the usual. So segment number one, idea filtering. Segment number two, planning planning with uh, and using tools. Segment number three, client work versus personal projects. Segment number four, completion and accountability. And of course, our recurring segment, web news, deploying to production stress. Uh, and then we have a conclusion for you there. So moving on to the very first segment. Um, so basically what we're going to be doing, I'll just give actually a brief introduction to the show first before we jump in because a lot of these segments kind of intertwine with each other. So what this show is going to be focusing on is personal slash business projects. So either something that I would work on myself or maybe Mike and I would work on uh, as a part of Digital Dynasty Design uh, versus sort of client work and other projects because the procedure is different for those. Um, and we're also going to be jumping in specifically to the tools we use. Like I said, the segment names kind of lend to themselves, but the tools we use, some of the planning procedures that we've made up, and then, of course, the first segment here, perfect transition to idea filtering. So what I mean by idea filtering is it's the filtering of a bunch of brainstormed ideas. It's taking the ones that didn't make the cut. Maybe they were redundant or bad in some way, and we just cut them. So we've broken broken down this segment actually into a few different a few different uh, little subsections, I guess you could say. So I'm going to go over my tips. Mike's going to go over his, and then we're going to kind of talk about how we collaboratively filter things, as you would kind of in a small team, or at least that's this is how we do it. So my tips are, so brainstorming can be kind of a hectic mess and can bring up a lot of terrible ideas. One thing that I do 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 though is I jot down all my ideas, even if they're very obviously bad or redundant. And when I say redundant, I mean like a duplicate of an existing product. So I write it down just in a one, just in a one note. It's non-formal. I just jot, I just jot them down for myself. I don't have like a specific format or anything. I just have like a set, a section in one of my OneNote uh, pages then I just kind of jot everything down there. What I'll generally do too is I will try to sleep on my, uh, sleep on my ideas so I don't really want to jump to go too crazy into them right away. So one of the things that we had kind of learned as we developed ideas in the past is I, you know, one of us would come up with a really great idea and you'd be like, oh man, this is, you know, this is going to be awesome. This is going to be the next big, you know, whatever it is, website or the next big video thing or whatever. But what you kind of do is you start to, you start to pigeonhole yourself and you start, you start developing the business that doesn't even exist yet, assuming it's going to be successful. So what ends up happening is uh, one of the examples that I, I came up with earlier is let's say Uber did not exist and you came up with some sort of dr- like ride sharing program. But let's say your first MVP idea was you were going to have it so that instead of having an app, you were going to have people are going to text a certain keyword to one of those numbers, you know, text drive to whatever, right? But then in your own head, as you start developing the idea, you might go something like, oh, I, I should develop an app. But first of all, it's like, well, now hang on a minute here. In the real world, you should probably do that text idea first, develop it, see if it works. And then if an app is called for, you should do it. So you start to pigeonhole yourself and kind of get really ahead of yourself. So that's generally that's generally something to kind of watch out for. And you're like, you just don't want to get into one of those pitfalls. Now, there are exceptions to those rules. Sometimes you've been thinking about something uh, a lot or you've been kind of 
you know, brainstorming a lot and you kind of have a, a bit of a culmination of ideas. And what I'll, I'll call this kind of like a really packed or a really full idea. And you feel really strong about a, a really strongly obligated to actually develop the idea. And, you know, you'll jot down the maybe the MVP of the idea and then you'll continue to go through the idea and you'll be like, oh, I should do this and we should do this and we should do this. So really, like, there's no exact way to discern which which way you should go. But I would say that if, you know, if you if you have a gut feeling that you really that you already that you have a really kind of almost prized idea and something that maybe you've been thinking off and on about and then you've come up to like this big conclusion of an idea and you really want to develop it, like write a whole page of notes or something, go for it. But just don't fall into that that pitfall of getting too far ahead of yourself. I mean, that's that's kind of my procedure when it comes to brainstorming. Um, I do a lot of the brainstorming for our ideas. I'm going to throw it over to Mike now, though, because he has a bunch of brainstorming tips as well for you. Yeah, for sure. So um, I want to just reiterate that point that Matt made with like falling into pitfalls and kind of going ham on an idea right away. Um, I think we, we've done that a few times, right? Like uh, one of us will come up with something and just think it's the the bomb and we'll, we'll, we'll want to kind of create it that day almost. Uh, and if you don't sleep on it, you kind of get to this point where you're, you're going, you're, you're investing your, your entire mind into it and you're putting too much on it. And when some, something comes up, let's say you, you talk to someone about it and they kind of shoot it down, you get almost defensive and that's never what you want to do. You want to take all the information that people give you and, go through it with a cool mind and not try to like make up excuses that that would make the idea good so i, I think that was a good call out matt uh, i didn't think of that one so <laughs> we yeah. definitely we've definitely probably done that on maybe three or four of our beginning projects some of them had never came to actual production but we've definitely done that a few times yeah for sure we're just like oh this is the best idea ever but for sure so w- with me i don't do too too much brainstorming because i'm mostly um I don't know, my, my brainstorming ability, I think, is not the greatest. I mostly rely on math for that. But I do a little bit, and I have a Google Doc where I'll just, like, write down ideas that I think, you know, great article would be on this. Or what about, like, coding something like this up? What framework do I want to work on next? Uh, stuff like that. More generic ideas, I think, than, like, you know, a specific, like, I have this great idea for an app that'll make us millions of dollars. Or I have this great idea for an app that we can use to, like, learn on. Um I don't do too much of that, but mostly just like stuff that I want to learn, uh, stuff that I think is cool and might help me. Like one time I made a, a quick timer application for my gym routine because I couldn't find the exact thing that I wanted on on the app store. Um, so stuff, stuff like that sometimes will work for me. But mostly, yeah, just Google Doc, easy, easy typing in there. And then when when I need that uh, that idea, when I'm kind of sitting there and thinking of something, I'll go to the Google Doc, I'll pick one of those ideas, and I'll try to flush it out a little more. So I won't, th- that provides that kind of sleeping mentality on it. So I sleep on it for maybe even multiple days, multiple months even. And when I come back to it, I have a kind of more of a fresh mind and I can go and flush it out and have a less bias to it. Like, oh yeah, that's not even my idea kind of thing, which I find helps. The other thing I do is sometimes... Uh, I'll just quickly open up a code editor and try to prototype something real quick. So, uh, for example, with the hex dash that I'm programming uh, recently, I just found this weird hexagon pattern online, and I'm like, oh, well, that would be really cool in CSS. So I found how to do a hexagon in CSS, and then I kind of put two and two together with Vue.js as a component. So each hexagon is a component. You can put different applications into into the hexagon, so like a note or something like that. And that I kind of just prototype that in like I don't know around an hour, maybe a little bit less. And that gave me kind of a visual aspect of it, which I'm, I'm a little bit better with. So I like to, I like to picture my ideas and see them in real life, uh, whether that be a picture or actual code. I don't spend too much time on it. If it takes more than an hour, I don't think it's worth it because again, this is just brainstorming and just kind of trying to get something in your head moving. Uh, but I, I do like to code a little bit while I'm brainstorming. Cause it, it, I don't know, coding kind of gets my, it gets, gets me going, gets my blood boiling, and I can get a little bit more done. Um, so, yeah, uh, anything else you want to add to that, Matt? Well, I was just going to ask, like, we, we were taught in college when we did prototypes for, like, actual hardware that your prototype, you know, whereas it should be decently organized, it, it, it should be rough around the edges. Would you say mm-hmm. that, would you say that you, 
you do that with your code prototypes where like maybe it's not perfectly commented or perfectly you know maybe oh. there's like a glitch in it but you just don't care because you're just prototyping yeah definitely like this this hex dash thing that i'm talking about uh i just recently went in there and cleaned it cleaned it up a little bit and yeah there was some code there was some redundant code in there that was just bad like it was just really bad but i don't like when i code it i don't think about that i just kind of see a solution in my head and i do it it might not be the most efficient and this this time it definitely was not the most efficient uh so yeah you like to your to answer your question for sure it's very rough around the edges when i do the prototyping so so yeah let's uh let's move on a little bit to collaboration since i think that this kind of the the next thing i want to talk about is the fact that you can't really just be alone with your idea um unless you're a brilliant mind which i i'm not for sure but if I, I need to kind of express my idea out there, like put it out there and see what reaction people get. And I'm not looking like when I, when I do this, like, so I do it usually with Matt, uh, we, we get on a Skype call or we go to, we, we go to my, uh, my basement and we get the whiteboard out. I don't expect it to be like, Matt's going to be like, Oh my God, I love this idea. I just want Matt. I just want someone to kind of give me feedback that I'm, that I, I, a, I don't expect to hear and B that would like, assume that he's interested in it like because the worst thing you can do is just say an idea and hear nothing be like oh i really want like i really want to get this a b and c app out there and that your partner's like oh okay that's that right there you know you have a bad idea so i like i don't i'm not never expecting him to be like oh man that's the best idea ever let's put all of our effort into it and get a million dollars because we're doing it uh, no, definitely not. But I want like if if I get that feedback and I get a bunch of questions, that means that it might be something to go on. Um, so that's kind of like where I go with collaboration. I like the those those talks, those those sessions. Maybe I'll I'll bounce it off a couple friends as well that aren't as tech oriented, just high level, um, and see what they have to say. But other than that, it, that's pretty much what I do. So Matt, do you have anything to add to collaboration? Um, I think one of the things, actually, the, the first thing that came to mind when we were writing the, the show notes for this is mm-hmm. is that, uh, what's, the, what's the show name? Um, not Dragon's Den. Uh, Shark Tank. Shark mm-hmm. Tank, it, it, I've seen it on Shark Tank a few times where, where somebody will be like, you know, you should really uh, grill, like you should really get grilled on your ideas. Where it's yeah. like, if you're left alone, maybe your unique situation or maybe your own motivation just to make something, because maybe, be, maybe it's going to be easy for you to make. It, you know, will motivate you to think like, oh, it'll be super successful and everyone will buy it. But you really do need that that third party, whether it be, you know, someone like you where you're in industry or somebody outside of industry to really comment on it and be like, dude, like, I'll just use this app for that. Like, why would I go to your site for this? You know mm-hmm. what I mean? So you yeah. really do need to be almost grilled on you really need to like, have your idea grilled to really bang out those pros and cons of what you're doing. And then you can make a decision on, hey, do I want to like keep going or do I do I not? Right. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think I, unless you have any more comments on that, I think that I think we'll move on to segment number two, which is uh, planning with and using tools. So there's a ton of different organization and communi- communication tools that you can organize and work on projects. Of course, we've all heard the app overload web news segment. Um, so main examples, of course. So we got Slack. We got Twist. We got Monday.com, which I've never used, by the way. We have Asana. We have Git, which includes things like GitLab, GitHub, Bitbucket. Uh, something as simple as email, contacts, calendar. Those can be used, of course and uh, Trello. Um, Mike, do you have any other additions or any comments specifically about those before we kind of go go on with it? Yeah, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about Asana, like an Asana type workflow uh, when using these tools. And I know we've talked about it before, but I'll just, I'll just quickly glance over it. Um, pr- pretty much like it's a task manager and it's great to get your actual idea onto the task manager. And I think we'll talk about it a little bit later on and show how we exactly do that. But uh, the, these tools... They're not the be all end all. Like you could use probably, uh, you know, sticky notes or just paper and pen and notepads. It's the it's the point of actually visualizing your tasks and visualizing your your entire project and being able to cross stuff off. That I think that's really important to to know how to do. Like to to be able to um, to be able to visual like to be able to plan it almost like a project manager and be able to continue with the project and be able to stay on task. 
these tools should help with that. They, but they are not the be all end all. You need to you need to decide what's best for you to to be able to manage it. But I don't think that not using anything, including not writing it down anywhere, is the way to go. I think you should definitely pick something, pick a tool, and try it. And maybe you you'll you'll like it, maybe you won't. So go on to the next tool. There's hundreds of them out there. We just mentioned like the top ones that we know of and there's probably ones that are even more popular than all these that we don't know about so definitely do your research get get the tool for that's right for the job that works for you um then another question for you matt actually trello i believe you're you're using that uh do you have any specific comment on it because i've heard of it a couple times with other people talking about it i'm just wondering what what it is so the reason why i use trello um and the reason will lend itself to what it is so Mm -hmm. i don't know if you remember we we you had mentioned your whiteboard. You used like the the organization method from Silicon Valley, I think it was. Yeah. And with like the sticky notes, so mm-hmm. I like that visualization, but I I really hate paper. Like I hardly write anything down anymore. Yeah. And so when uh, Asana released, so Asana is like a task manager. We'll get into that in a bit. But Asana is like a task manager, like your general like you know check off these tasks on the list. They added sort of something like that where there were like columns and you could like move things around in different columns and stuff. And we started doing it there. But I feel like Trello is just better at that. Mm-hmm. But I all but most most recently, and this is what made me like really dig into Trello, is I have like cards set up uh, for a bunch of things. So for example, with HTML all the things, I used to fumble around and constantly have to regather our like shareable links. Mm-hmm. And like I started using like Bitly for some of it, but I would like grab our like profile link and I'd grab this and I'd grab that. And it was all over the place. Now I just have like a Trello card. You can, there's like different styling uh, types and like literally, so it's like, I have a little column there. I have a Trello card that says links. I click in there mm-hmm. and I can literally just like grab our link. So it'll, it'll so, literally say social and I'll like grab it really quick. So it keeps styling and stuff too. So you can literally copy paste. It, uh, it's like Trello styling specifically. Like it's, okay. it, it's like a formatting I, I don't want to say language because I don't think it's it's really that complex, but more okay, or less yeah. what it is is it's like you can you can have like a full like little document in there with notes. You can have like uh, you can have like a, like tasks. You can have like little check boxes. You can add images in there. You can add things. So for example, so I'll just give like a, a full example for how I how I use this with it. So mm-hmm. I have like I have like our main sort of like standstill thing, which is like has our links has like for HTML all the things has our links has our like different uh, URLs for maybe getting around to like maybe admin panels and stuff like that. So I have all those. And then I have other things that, that are sort of more dynamic. So for example, when I was, because Roma is one of the templates that we were working on right at the beginning. So for Roma, what I did was I said, okay, I'm going to make, um, I, I may be getting the terminology confused here just to, just to be clear with everybody. I'm still a relatively new Trello user because there's like cards and a bunch of other stuff. But I, I made a column uh, for Roma. And then I made like a card for it. And my one card was competing sites. So I went and I looked around and was like, okay, these are what, these are other museum sites. And then I went in and I, I made another card and I was like, what, what needs to be like, what's common among all of these? Like, what do museum sites use? Do they use calendars? Do they use, you know, do they use, uh, I don't know what CMS, do they use images? Do they have sliders? Like a whole bit, there's a whole bunch of stuff. And I like went through there and I made that. And then I said, okay, now I'm going to make another little card that says, that says, um, that says like what exactly I'm going to do. So this is my MVP. This is what I'm going to do. And then I had, and then I went and gathered some stock photos. So I had another one where I have just stock photos and have the links. So everything's all there, but I like the fact that I can change it. And I like the fact that it's all like, it's, it's it, assuming you organize it. Like it's, it's a more free form mm-hmm. organizer. I find where I, I can make my own template within these little cards. I can like open it up and be like, Oh, I need my links. I click in there. I made my own little structure. Where I was like, these are social, these are blog, these are like, et cetera. Mm-hmm. So I really like that. And that, that's, that's sort of what I use it for. I just find it a little bit more compatible than Asana just for me. I still mm-hmm. use Asana for tasks. Um, I, and I do prefer Asana for tasks because that is kind of its, its structure. But I, I use Trello for, I would say, a hybrid of asset management as well as as tasks, if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. I think it like so it's visually more appealing for that kind of stuff for like because like, you were mentioning that it's a free form. So you can kind of have a free form organization of your, uh, I guess, of your 
Of like like the actual idea. like yeah yeah like so it's still in like columns and it's still in the cards so like that's very structured but then like mm-hmm. I made it so like what I was doing was I was just adding links and then I got to the point where I was like Jesus like this is getting a little bit out of hand yeah. I was like I got a lot of links here so I said okay I need to reorganize this so I made a social thing I made this I made like a social yeah. thing a blog thing a this. so like I made that template w- right. within my structure and as we know I don't like using a lot of tools so yeah. I like making my own little organization thing and trello is used actually um by a really by like a lot of other things so you can have a public trello board Mm -hmm. so one of the things too um is Fortnite. they'll actually the devs actually have a public trello so Mm -hmm. if like i'm like fuck i'm like i'm experiencing this glitch in the game right in the game Fortnite, i could go to the public trello and it'll say if they know about it and if it's in progress if it's in development if it's blah 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 etc okay yeah so it's 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 interesting because we could open up let's say a trello board Mm-hmm. For maybe one of our huge templates, like if we were going to make a huge template, but we wanted user feedback, you can make a public facing one and people could actually comment and see what was happening. Cool. Can they can they go into that board without having a Trello account? I believe I was not logged in when I looked at the Fortnite one. That's really cool. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'll, I think I'll try it out for sure. Thanks yeah, it's for, super, thanks it, for it's, giving that little rundown. It's super, it's super mm-hmm. interesting. It's really robust for sure. Like I thought mm-hmm. it was very iffy in the beginning. Because I was just like, oh, it's just like everything else. But once I started using it, I'm like, damn, like I, I need my Trello board. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, um, but yeah, so I'll kind of keep diving into the rest of this, this segment, of course, uh, not to get caught up on Trello for too long. But uh, so this segment mostly covers, just to be clear, mostly covers personal slash business projects. Um, client work for us has a different procedure, and we will be discussing that in the next segment. But I just just so everybody knows that the procedure and the little comments I'm making today uh, in this segment are specifically for uh, personal or business projects. So basically, our procedure to put together a project is, as we've already mentioned in the first segment, our idea is filtered and approved uh, to begin work. And then what we do is we'll usually say, like, we know, once we've had that discussion, the filtering, we'll set up a proper folder structure depending on what the project requires. So maybe it needs needs a Git repo. Maybe it needs a, a folder structure um, it's on our shared OneDrive. And that is actually in a certain templated way that we've made. So we have a very specific way of organizing all of our files with certain subfolders and labeling. So that's a that's a template that we made that's made for us. And we definitely suggest that you guys do that too so you don't lose anything. Um, then we decide right after that, we decide who is going to do what. So we modularize the project into little digestible bits. And we go, okay, you know, Mike's going to work on the login, Matt's going to work on the nav bar, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, these little tiny pieces. And then we, and, and this is just in a pure conversation. This is usually in a, uh, in a phone call or on a, uh, on a Google Hangouts call or whatever, a Skype call. And we then translate those into actual writing. So we translate those into tasks in Asana. So we've mentioned Asana before. So what we literally do is we'll say like, okay, Matt does nav bar. So we literally will have like, you know, make the nav bar under the, under the, you know, the project name in Asana, and then we'll assign it to myself. And you can assign a due date to it and everything else in Asana. And then we'll do that, you know, for Mike as well. We'll get all his stuff. We'll get all my stuff. And then we will talk about deadlines. Like I mentioned, you can set a date on those tasks in Asana and we'll talk about deadlines. And we're on deadlines are a very key part of one of the other segments in the show. So I'm not going to touch too much on the importance of deadlines. But we'll start talking about a deadline or deadlines for various parts. Like maybe I need to make the nav bar so that Mike has a sign in button to do this. So like maybe I need the nav bar by tomorrow and then tomorrow, you know, midday tomorrow, Mike, once it's done, once I'm done, he can start the, the login form. So it, it, it keeps everything very structured, very together. And we do that in Asana and we're both logged into the same organization in Asana. So you can see everything. It's all very visible and it's all really there and there's a there's the more powerful features of asana but we or at least me i only really use it for the basics but it does the basics very well um so that's that's basically how we how we start our project without getting you know into the actual technicalities of doing the project because every project's different that's sort of the procedure we do and it's and it's always almost always like that um then of course because you're working on a project and because things come up and whatever we do have day-to-day tools that we use so for communication, for us, we'll use Google Hangouts or Skype or email. For uh, file and asset handling, we'll use Git. Normally, we'll use Bitbucket. Sometimes, we'll use GitHub. And then, of course, OneDrive, like I already mentioned. We have a shared OneDrive, so we both have the same access to those files. And then for organization, 
as I already mentioned, in, in length, Trello, which is just me, uh, and then Asana for uh, both of us. So we, we use Asana quite a bit. We've actually used Asana in, since like maybe the third day of our business. So it's definitely stuck with us. So if you're looking for a task manager, uh, go give that a go for sure. I don't know if you have any other comment, Mike, but I'll, uh, I'll pass it on to you to go to the next segment or maybe make another comment uh, as you will. Yeah, sure. Um, I just want to comment a little bit. So uh, we, we use Asana. We're, we're, we're a small team. It's just the two of us. I mean, the, ma- the max we've had on Asana, I think, is three uh, people. And I just want to point out that there's stuff like Microsoft Project. If you're working on a large team, like you want to get everyone aligned up. You want to make some Gantt charts where you you can see where the deadlines will end up. So if, if you have tasks that are reliant on each other that de- are dependent uh you, you you need to lay those out and make sure that the teams that are working on all those tasks match up to the schedule that you have set up so you're going to need a much more powerful software most likely than asana um i believe there are dependencies in asana but you have to do the paid version the free version doesn't allow dependencies and uh with a couple people again not a problem you can set it up with just dates due dates here and there but once you get a larger team, you're definitely going to want to look at a more robust uh, application like Microsoft Project. Um, and I think, yeah, that I'll, I'll move on a little bit now to uh, client work uh, versus personal projects. So Matt handles a lot of the personal projects that we do. Uh, I help him obviously here and there. And sometimes I do have my own personal projects that I, that I work on. But Matt is mostly on that. So I and that leads me to being on the client work and uh, Matt does do quite a bit of client work and I'm sure he'll have some stuff to add after this, um, after I talk about my stuff, but pretty much, uh, client work will refer to working with a different client other than ourselves. So a contract that we would get a, di- a person needing a website, um, some backend technology that we need to develop for someone. So that, that's when, when we talk about client work, that's what we're talking about. Someone contracts us to do something for them. Uh, it's it's great to have kind of this both these things. So we have the our personal projects which generate us something some income, and then we have client work which generates some income. So you're not putting all your eggs into one basket. You want to diversify as much as possible. So that's kind of why we do that. Uh, and also opportunity, right? We had the opportunity. Why not take it? And both of us are on the job. Correct. Yeah, both of us are constantly busy. Like especially now. Um, I don't know the last time I, where I've sat down and been like, oh, I can do nothing now. Like that's, I, I don't <laughs> think that's existed for the last like at least month or month and a half. Uh, I don't know about you, Matt. Like that's that's how it feels like right now, at least. There's always something, even if it's just some housekeeping. It's like it's yeah. got to be done. So let's yeah, do you it. You got to build now. this client. Like, like I always, I always delay the building of the clients because I just hate doing the administrative stuff. You have to do it. But uh, yeah, so I'll I'll, I'll move on. Um, so the general client work procedure is actually very similar to how we do the in, in-house work, the personal projects. Uh, the only difference is we don't do any idea filtering. So we don't do any of the brainstorming. Usually the client already comes up with the idea and comes to us with a, a fairly finished product. The only thing that we'll have to sometimes do is maybe uh, take them down to earth and be like, listen, for the amount of money that we're going to be paid, this is what we can do. So we kind of get the requirements from them. It's very important uh, The first, that instead of idea filtering, I think requirements is what replaces it. And that's just as important because if you don't have the correct requirements from your client, so the, the requirements means what you actually need to get done, what the client wants in very simple easy to use phrases like so each feature is just a one sentence phrase that clearly describes what the client wants out of that feature so that when you get those down you have them on paper you can get it you can get it signed you can get it in a contract that's what you're going to be working on and i'm not saying to be like rigid on this because obviously as you as you start programming as the client starts using the application he's going to be like oh i didn't think of this i need to add this but pretty much if it's not reasonable, if it's not a reasonable addition, uh, don't do it for free. If it's if it is a reasonable addition, like uh, I, I believe Matt has like a limit of like if it's like a you know ten minutes a thirty minute addition, he'll add it to the requirements and you know he won't charge for that. Um, and I kind of do the same the same thing, give or take, depending on how the complexity of it. Uh, so so you you got you gotta be somewhat flexible, but you also have to be very considered over your own time and you can't just 
do everything that the client says because the client will want to change a lot of things. The client will constantly want to change many, many different things about the requirements. But if you have them written down, if you have very clear set requirements where the client's like, oh yeah, that's exactly what I wanted it to do, which is actually very difficult to get those requirements. Uh, if you have those down, then you're kind of in a much better place when you start working on the project and you might be, you'll probably be able to finish the project in, a, in the correct deadline. Um, but another thing that helps with this situation is um, going through a daily meeting. So sometimes clients won't be able to do that. Not all clients will. I have one larger client where if we're working actively on a project, we are doing daily meetings and that has helped us keep focus immensely. Like it's night and day compared to my like once a week or twice or twice every month communications that I have with some other clients because you lose track of things. So you're, you're developing, you're developing a feature and you you get in your own head because like oh you you know how to develop it and you're developing it but then when the client sees it after two weeks of not communicating he's like that's not what i wanted instead you can have a daily thing where yeah you've developed it but you've only put spent a day on it yes it's rough around the edges you explain that to your client and they see but but when they see it they can correct it earlier than when you've already solidified your code when you've already cleaned it up like you when you cleaned up your code you really don't want to go back and start typing stuff in there again because you're going to mess it up again you're going to put a bunch of comments you're going to put a bunch of dev code in there and it's it's just not it's not nice i i like i like doing a, a i i code cleanly when i code but i obviously have a refactor phase where i go back and i get rid of all the dev comments and i make sure that the code is as minified as possible because that that's how developers should be should be coding in in today's era so that it's important to, to be communicable with the client. So the client should be able to contact you. Um, you should also make sure that you have uh, boundaries as well. So communication, yes, they should be able to contact you. Yes, you should respond all the time, but not like all, when I say all the time, I mean work hours. Set your work hours and barring any urgency, barring any emergence, emergency kind of situation, stick with them. So if a client consistently tries to talk to you outside of your work hours and everyone's work hours are different, by the way. So some people uh, like I think, Matt, you work late, right? Like you, you have a late schedule so you can you, you you're fine with having client communications later on at night. Right? Yeah, like a lot a lot of the time, like I'll kind of either like I'll more or less finish at like eight or nine usually sometimes exactly. even like 10, like because I'll, I'll start later in the day just because that's I don't know. I just prefer that. Yeah, and that that's pre, that's pure preference. So like if if uh, if you like the the later part of the day, and then set those boundaries. Be like, listen, I don't, I'm I'm not available from you know eight a.m. till twelve a.m. So or twelve p.m. So just contact me after twelve p.m. And usually clients can accommodate that. Sometimes you'll have to make special adjustments because of time zones, because of clients clients work schedules. But as long as you have a schedule set up, it actually makes things a lot easier and. Usually when you have a schedule set up, you can kind of be ready for the communication. Again, you can do that prep work before a meeting that we were talking about last week. Um, stuff like that. That stuff's important. Uh, so it, another thing is make like it depends who you have on these meetings as well. Like I, I know I'm talking about meetings a lot, but these are really important in the client in in client work. So you got to get you got to get used to them and you got to get comfortable with having to communicate your progress, code review with your client, depending on how technical your client is. So if you have meetings with multiple people, if you have a business minded person in the meeting, like a CEO that doesn't understand the technology, but he's involved in the process of creating this project that you're doing, then make sure that you bring your level of speak down or to a higher level so that they understand it. So instead of saying very code related, like, oh, I put this uh, JavaScript function in here to do uh, this specific task, explain to them in a way that they would understand what it means. So um, like I made the button when I press the button, yeah. the blue light turns on. Exactly. Yeah. Like, so yeah, it, that that's what, that's exactly it. So um I think I had something here. So for, for like a, a single page application, let's say there should be, it should be very sim simple to ex explain to a client why you want to do a single page application rather than doing something that's uh, uh, the, the traditional way of doing it. 
So stuff that you would say to a business minded person is like you, the, the single page application will be a little will be more responsive. It'll be more fluid. Uh, the reason for that would be because we're not loading the whole page every time. We're only loading the sections that change during the transition. So if you press on a button, uh, the action that 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 surrounds that button, that's the only thing that changes. The rest of the page remains static, remains the same. So that's why it's a much more fluid uh much more fluid experience. Uh, there's a higher flexibility for adding future add-ons because of the lower uh, the lower complexity of the code. Um, it's just a more modern way of doing things. Like stuff like that, uh, when you're talking to someone business-minded, they'll appreciate it as well because they don't want to hear you talk about syntax. They don't want to hear you talk about the coding language that you chose. Uh, that's not important to them. The important, it's important to them to know that their task is being completed and what some of the decisions you make, you will have to explain. So that's why I'm trying to tell you, like explain it to them in a higher level that they'll understand. So that's, those are my kind of um, suggestions for doing client work. Be communicable. Again, that's really important to have. Keep your deadlines. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that in actually the next segment. Uh, especially the deadlines part. So I'm going to pass it off to Matt. Do you have anything to add on this segment? Yeah, I think I think one of the things that you that you mentioned about, you know, sort of setting your hours and sort of being like what some people would seem would think, especially if they're new in the industry would be like harsh on a client mm -hmm. really isn't. I think one of the things that people forget is like they like the client are people too. So like maybe they're gone for a family event at this time. And then like you're working diligently and you email them, right? And you're not going to be, because you're the, the person that's been hired, you're not going to be like, you know, damn that guy, like he's not going to answer me and it's 10 p.m. And like, where is he? You know what I mean? Like I mean, yeah. he's busy doing something. So if you if you are, you know, busy doing something and, you know, you've been reasonable and you have been working, like you do have to do, you know, your due diligence and you have to bend sometimes if, you know, if maybe time zones don't line up or what have you or urgency. But generally speaking, like they're going to understand. And if you miss an email or something like that, which has happened all weekends to us, you just say that like you just I don't cover it up. I'll just be like, hey, I, I didn't check my email this this weekend. Like, sorry, and like on the on, you know, on the Monday morning and, and here's some work done or whatever. Uh, that's another actually good one, too. This isn't really procedure based, but one of the things I will do is if I do miss an email like that, sometimes I will I will like like throw it in with a bunch of work. Like maybe I'll do a little extra work for them that day, just like a little bit, just maybe in 20 minutes or something, something that maybe they expected on Tuesday that I'm going to finish on Monday, just to sort of like soften the blow. Cause like most clients don't actually really care. Like it was the weekend or whatever, but just, you know, don't, don't be so scared to be like, Oh my God, I got to have my ringer on at all times. And I got to check my email every 10 minutes and I got to like be here, whatever. Like, I mean, if it wasn't a scheduled work time and you didn't miss something that wasn't scheduled, then like, you know, really, you know, whatever, you know what I mean? Like stuff happens, you were gone, what have you, right? You can't always have your phone kind of attached to you. So I think that that's, that's a really key thing that, that you mentioned because we, in the beginning, really had that problem where we were like, oh man, like this guy contacted me two days ago, like, and I didn't see it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, oh no, mm -hmm. but it's not really that big of a deal for sure. Uh, and then one of the other things too, <clears throat> to me, uh, one of the other things too uh, that you mentioned was when you... Uh, how do I, how do I describe this? So when you start to change your language, so you start like using less like, uh, you start using like the higher, higher level, level language, yeah. the higher mm -hmm. level, that, that's how you put it, the mm -hmm. higher level language. And you start like talking to like a, a CEO or even just like a non-technical person on the call. I think that that was a really, really key point too, is because you need to be um, flexible with that because sometimes there'll be an engineer and that guy on the call. Yep. And sometimes the engineer will ask you a question and you kind of have to give him an engineering answer. But then at the same time, sometimes like I'll, like I'll, um, suffix it with something like, oh yeah, I put the, like you said, I put the JavaScript function here and blah, 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 which makes the light turn on when I press the button. Like I'll just do like a real quick preamble at the end there, or mm -hmm. I guess it's not a preamble, but I'll, I'll, I'll add that little bit at the end there just for the person in the call. So he's just like, oh, I didn't know what the hell they just said in that whole paragraph, mm -hmm. <laughs> but I generally got it. So just, that's just something that I, I personally do whenever I can like, uh, kind of like Jimmy it in there. So yeah, that's a good idea. Um, I think we can move on to, I think we can move on to segment four, which is completion, uh, and accountability. And this is the segment that has a lot to do about the deadlines that I was mentioning mm -hmm. before, but, um, 
So what it is, is like when you when you are your own boss, you need to sort of write down concrete dates in order to push yourself along. So if you don't have a concrete date written down, the risk of procrastination seems to be much higher. And chances are literally nothing will get done if very little. So if you're working on a small team, assigning specific people tasks for accountability is crucial. And you should really, you know, sort of make the habit out of it. Um, sometimes, sometimes deadlines do move. And especially when objective shifts of so the project has changed due to the market or it, the project has changed in some way, you really, you know, you, you can move those dates, but you really should be kind of hard on yourself and kind of treat it like even like whether you're working solo or in a small team, you should treat, you should treat it like as if it's like, damn, like we got to move this date or, you know, maybe can we do this other thing to accelerate it to still hit the date? Like you really should try to hit the date. Sometimes dates need to change, but just don't, don't make that something you do on the daily. Don't make that a habit that you always do. Um, and, and since, since you are your own boss, like I said, accountability is really hard. Because you're not like you're going to punish yourself. You're not going to like put yourself on some sort of like, I don't know, some sort of like performance improvement. Or you're not going to like, you know, try to like track yourself more or something. Like like that's not going to happen. Like whatever a boss would do to you, like that's just not going to happen. So you need to assign yourself those tasks with a deadline. But what I would do is is don't just set a deadline. Like literally use a program. So something like Asana with push notifications on or whatever software you, you want to use. Maybe it's a calendar, even something as simple as that. And, and if you're in a small team, maybe make it visible to the team as well so that it's putting a little bit of pressure on you. Like, you know, if I'm supposed to finish, if I'm supposed to finish something by September 2nd and I'm in a small team on Asana and I don't, you know, I'm, first of all, I'm getting the push notifications, you know, not telling me, Hey, you know, you got to finish this. You got to finish this. That's a little bit of pressure. But then, you know, if your team isn't already, you know, kind of yelling at you, cause maybe you're, you're blocking somebody else from doing something, they might start, lo- start, start yelling at you or they can at least like see it. They can literally see like, hey, like, you know, this guy didn't do his job on September, like by September 2nd, like what the heck. And again, you know, things do happen, but don't try to make a habit out of it kind of thing. Um, filling out a daily, uh, a daily logbook. So this is something that I do personally, um, myself, uh, myself, and I do it literally for myself. I, it's not formal in any way. There's, I don't check for typos. I don't have a specific format. I just go into a one note and I just kind of go ham. And what I start doing is is I just literally write down what I did. So, oh, I, I made the thumbnail for this. I did the social post on this. I made this guy's website. I called this guy. I, I did this. I do that. I don't put any personal information in there. Nothing like that. It's just real quick notes. But what it is, is it allows me to, because sometimes when you're faced with insurmountable work, and I actually have a, an, a Medium article started on this. It's not up yet. But when you're faced with like what seems like insurmountable work, you're kind of like, damn, like I didn't do anything all day, even though I've been like sitting here for eight hours or 10 hours or whatever it is. But in reality, if you keep that log book, especially if you fill it out as you go and you like, you know, oh, I finished, you know, I, I made the thumbnail, like write that down really quick. I did this and I'll write that down really quick. You'll see, you're like, damn, I got like, you know, 15 points done here in my log book. Like I actually did do quite a bit. And what that also does is it kind of keeps you accountable too, because, you know, generally speaking, you're probably going to feel pretty bad if let's say you keep a logbook five days of the week. So Monday through Friday, and you see that like Monday through Thursday, you have like nothing or one point done. And then like, you know, the rest of the days you're like, you, you have like only like maybe a couple more. So then when you come in the next week, you're going to look and be like, damn, I didn't do anything last week. Like hardly anything. So I think, I think that's one thing that kind of really helps me. And it also keeps me organized too. Like sometimes I'll be like on a phone call and someone will be like, Hey, when, when did you put together when did you put together my homepage and I can go back to my logbook and just quickly check. So it's just something, it's just kind of a double, a double uh, usage there. Mm-hmm. And also try to maybe limit yourself in some capacity. So for example, I'm not going to buy this watch I want until I finish website a, right? I got to get this website out. I'm not going to, like, I have the money, but I'm not going to buy this thing until I do it. So maybe, like that, that requires, and actually most of this requires like a lot of discipline on yourself, but it's one of those things where, like even we've done it, Mike and I have done it, where we'll come up with a project and a lot of our very, very early projects, many haven't come to fruition because we wouldn't set a deadline. We wouldn't say like, hey, this needs to be done or we wouldn't modularize it or we wouldn't use a procedure, which is how this procedure came to be. We wouldn't use a procedure and then it would just be like, oh, well, we've been, you know, haven't done it in four months and we just decided to do client work. So I'm not motivated to do that project at all now. Let's just 
either come up with a new idea or keep up with the client work. So you gotta, you do have to be disciplined to an extent, but also be, don't go crazy on yourself. If objectives change, you know, be, you know, at, at your discretion, kind of like adjust if you need to. Mm-hmm. I'm going to toss, uh, I think I'm going to toss it to Mike because I think he has some comments on uh, this type of thing, but for a larger client. So I'll, I'll throw it over to you, Mike. Yeah, for sure. Um, so yeah, I like I like your idea on the logbook. Actually, I don't do that, and I have been wanting to. Uh, right. Do you do like any hours on there, or do you just put like literally what you did? Not, that's it, just rough. Literally, literally what I did. Like yeah. even even right now, when we finish the show, I will go into my logbook and say like recorded the show, and then well, because I'm gonna prepare it, so recorded mm-hmm. the show, edited the show, you know, made the the social posts, and then tomorrow I'll say like posted the social link. Yeah, like post it on Instagram because like I I need to know everything I did. Yeah, yeah, I understand. Okay, so yeah, I'm, I might start doing that. I kind of do that with uh, my like work hours, but uh, I I think I should just do that on a general basis because I don't do that for my own work. So it's a good call. Um, so yeah, so working working with a larger client, um, staying on top of deadlines, I feel like monetarily that's what's motivating you to do it so make sure that you know that like if you don't get this deadline they might not hire you again they might not give you another contract like you need to get this deadline and if you don't get this deadline there better be a good reason for it like the requirements crept up there was a feature creep uh you know there there has to be reasoning behind it it's not just no you were just sitting there and doing nothing or no you were just like you were prioritizing your own work over your client's work you can't do that if you take on a client if you take on a contract make sure they're satisfied then move on to your own work um i also really like the this is business speak but under promise over deliver uh i think all my clients know that i'm notorious for that but they, they seem happy with it because they know what they're getting um i don't like to say something that i know something very well unless i really know it really well now that's not saying that i'm not willing to take on tasks and challenges and i always am but i make sure that i'm up front with the client to a certain degree where being like if i've never heard of that language i'll be like oh i'll just need to research it a little bit more Uh, i don't say no i'm not going to do that because i don't know it i'm just i'm more up front with them than maybe what should be like i know a lot of people say like oh just say yes to any project but uh, i think that's leading to my next point which is taking on too much so if you like if you're if you need to design a full website in a new, in a new framework, right. And you don't explain to the client that I haven't done this before, or that you, you're not an expert at this. They're expecting you to get this done in X amount of time and for X amount of money. But really you need to make sure that they understand that, no, you're going to, you're going to get it done and it's going to be good for sure. But you're, you're going to take some more time because you want to make sure that it's correctly done and you want to build it in the most modern way possible that and w- with all the backwards compatibility you want to you want to lay it lay it to them in in a in a good way but you want to make sure that they understand as well that you're not going to do it in in two days you're not you haven't done this for 10 years of your life you're going to do it well but you you're not the expert that maybe if they are looking for that they can go for someone else but that's where you got to meet the client in the middle sometimes with pricing as well. And we can talk about pricing maybe in another episode, I think. But yeah, so those are the kind of points that I want to add to the to just dealing with a larger client with accountability. I think the monetary stuff, it really helps um, because like, you know that if you're not going to do this, you're going to lose out money. So I'm going to think I think I'm going to move on to the next and final segment, which is the classic web news. Again, we still don't have a jingle for this. I really want to get a jingle. <laughs> I don't really like, know. I, I mean, I haven't researched it. But I don't really know, like, how hey, one how one produces a jingle. Hey, <laughs> if, we, if we have any talented audio producers in, the, in our audience, let us know. Send us a send us a DM on Twitter or Instagram or something. And uh, we can we can talk. Maybe we can get something going. Uh, but yeah, we, we want a jingle for web news. No, no jingle yet. So stay tuned. Uh, so this web news is about stress when deploying to production. Uh, and the reason I chose this and it's kind of a little bit topical is because I saw a Reddit post uh, recently where there's like a, a few uh, many developers talking and one of the developers is like 10 years experience and he's saying that he constantly like he has severe stress and severe anxiety about posting to production. And I understand that like I I just did a po- a production run today actually and um and yeah you get that little bit of stress. I think I've gotten better at it. I think I've gotten better at like containing the stress. I'm not saying it got better at actually deploying to production because I don't 
you can get better at it, but it's always going to be that like it's always difficult and it's always you, you always want to make sure that you're doing it correctly. Uh, but pretty much I'll just point out a couple ways that I elevate the stress. So testing. Uh, I'm not going to talk like in depth about testing because I'm, I think we're going to have an episode just discussing all the different testing. Uh, so stay tuned for that. But like pretty much unit testing, integration testing, end to end testing, you have to do a combination. You can't just go, oh, I'm, I unit tested. It's all good to go. Well, if you unit tested and you didn't do any integration testing in a new library that you added just recently broke one of your one of your dependencies, especially when you're deploying it to production. You're never going to find that out. So you have to do some integration testing, especially if you're adding new libraries. But really, you should be doing integration testing every time because uh, any code that you change could break a dependency, could break some sort of a library that you've added even in the past. Uh, so that's my test and make sure you do you test well. Don't spend all your time on testing, but as long as you run a, a set number of tests that you're comfortable with and everything passes, kind of get, get your confidence up about that. Don't be like, oh, these tests are nothing. No, the tests are important and they show you that your stuff is working. So just be confident about that. Uh, then version backups. So right before you do a deployment, make sure you make a backup. Uh, obviously, if, you, you, if you're using Git, you have those backups already in place. Uh, they might take you a little bit longer to pull down and deploy, but I like to actually make a folder backup of what I'm, of what I'm about to replace, so that it, if anything happens critical, I can just quickly do a do a swap. So then there's a, so then there's predictable testing in production environments. So that to that I want to refer to Docker. Uh, Docker is a cool little application where you have. The ability to create these little microservices that you can run right on your local machine and they kind of package like a node.js deployment a mongodb deployment into a separate container vm almost but they don't run as a, as a complete vm so they run a little like a, like a microservice and they run a little bit more efficiently because they're using very like the resources that only they are needed like that are that are needed for them and the, the other advantage is that if you deploy to a docker container at on your local machine and then you deploy to a Docker container on like a digital ocean uh, droplet, it's going to be the same experience. So that's a great way to like test before you deploy. That's what I'm trying to say. So using using Docker will really give you a little bit more confidence because you know that if you if, if everything's working locally on your machine, uh, it's most likely or almost 100% going to work on the machine uh, at that digital ocean uses because the same container localized environment, it's great for that. Um, I, I think I'm going to have another section on Docker, especially, uh, and I've, I've been using it a little bit now, uh, especially for deploying node and even a little bit for a web server, just, just to get the consistency going because web servers are all different. Like some of them don't, don't allow for dot slash. Some of them need the dot slash, um, for, for file referencing. So I, I like, I think Docker is a cool way of doing that because if you have Docker and it works on one, in one way, then when you deploy to a web server, deploy to a server it's going to work that exact way uh, so you don't have any of those failures so the deployments like like everyone else i think anyone that's deployed many times to production you're going to have some situations that are considered bad deployments so like examples that i've had are like deployed code pointing to the development server which is bad because the development server doesn't have all the user data uh forgetting to comment out development testing code sometimes that could could do performance like could decrease performance because the development testing code is doing stuff that's not necessary for the actual production uh code that's not ready for the production environment so i pushed code that we didn't test enough right and it just broke many, many different features. So there's like usually a chain event where it's like, oh, this feature broke, this feature broke, this is blocking that. It's always a disaster. And then code not working in specific browsers is a very common one. So yes, I developed that for everything. Oh, I forgot that we have a client. We have clients that use Internet Explorer 8. So I have to go back and make sure everything's supported in Internet Explorer 8. So those things will happen, and I think the main thing that I want to take a, I want you to take away from the fact that there are failures is the fact that you can always restore, always make sure that you're in a place where you can restore, and if you can, then then that's that should alleviate, that should give you the confidence to go forward, and just be confident in yourself because um, those failures happen to everyone at every level. 
if someone's site has to go down, it has to go down. A, a company will understand. Most of the time, they'll understand that this is a live environment. What you're doing is complicated, and hopefully your client will be understanding of those situations because I'm sure it's happened to them on a different level, right? Like everyone makes mistakes. Yes, some mistakes are more costly than others, but you have to understand that mistakes happen and just move on from them and proceed the next time with the same level, even more confidence because you conquered that mistake, right? So um, another thing is like, just make sure you're on your toes. Uh, so you, you deploy and if it's a big deployment, especially you're going to have people that use your, your application. So like one, one of the applications that I work on uh, is used by like, it's not, it's not a huge amount, but it's like a couple thousand people a day. So I usually get good feedback almost right away. So, and it's usually very, very instantaneous because the people that use it use it a lot and they use it for very specific things if that specific thing doesn't work they'll reach out and get get in contact with you um silence is the best way to know that there's nothing wrong that's i love silence for that but if there isn't silence then be ready to uh to kind of roll back or conquer those issues as they come up usually uh the issue is very something really small something that someone forgot something that i forgot it's a quick like, you know, comment this out, delete this. It's not a big deal. So don't automatically panic that that's it. Everything's broken. Everyone can't explore, can't use your service. Just calmly control the situation and go through the go through your troubleshooting setup. Um, everyone, I'm sure everyone can do troubleshooting. That's an important part of this. Again, another episode on that will be coming up as well. Uh, but yeah, that's that's all I have on the this week's web news. It's not less I guess controversial than the usual ones, but it's more topical. And I think people should, should know that stress. Yes, you're going to have stress when deploying to production, but they should be able to conquer that and uh, kind of get down. Cause you don't want to always be stressed. Like stress in the, in, in, in workplace is going to lead to fatigue and it's going to lead to even more mistakes. So just calm down, make sure you're confident, make sure you go through your, your usual testing and you'll be fine. So yeah, uh, Matt, anything you want to add to that? Uh, I think well, I think one of the main things that you did that you said there, uh, I for sure agree with. Like, realistically, if you if you're at a, if you're at a point, I mean, sometimes it's not possible, but if you're at a point in which you can make it recoverable almost instantly, like if you're going to change a single directory and that's all you're going to change, and then you know you have a and you should really make an exact copy of it from what it is in production. So you make yeah. an exact copy of it. You know, you upload your change, it breaks, just like flip it back. Like it's exactly. like you really should prepare for that. That's like really, really key, I think. Yeah. Um, and myself, once I've done that, I don't care. <laughs> I know that sounds that sounds really bad, but like honestly, like I'm 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 I've like done. I'm I'm at the point where when I've worked enough on a project and I've like I'm confident enough in it, I will absolutely like I'll I'll stress if I miss something like uh, or I'll I'll stress almost when making those backups because sometimes there's a lot to back up mm -hmm. so i'll sometimes like you know make sure I, i'll like check it and check it and check it and check it but then once i like you know hit enter to upload i just don't care yeah. um i don't know whether that's like the right way to do it but um i mean it doesn't hold me back and it's not like i haven't done my due diligence and like done the backups but mm -hmm. a lot of the time too is if it's something that i can do at night so if it's like a you know a local small business site or something and i'm gonna change whatever and, and I can do it, you know, in the middle of the night when virtually nobody, if not literally anyone is using the site, I'll do it. Then if it breaks, I'll be like, okay, well, it's too late for me to fix it, but I'll revert it. And then I'll, I can just always tell the client and be like, Hey, I noticed a serious problem. So I'll fix it and just re-upload it. And like, people aren't going to be, I mean, if you push it back weeks or something, like, I'm sure they'll get upset. But if you say, Hey, I noticed a major problem. And I didn't want to break it. Like, you know, if you word it even that mm -hmm. way and I didn't want to break your site, they're not going to be like, well, the hell with you. <laughs> like, yeah. uh, like, and another thing too, actually to keep in mind is things like Facebook go down. Like, come on, like things like Facebook go down, Reddit goes down. Yeah. Reddit you went know. down for three hours or four hours yesterday. Yeah. Like, like Reddit goes down. Uh, I don't use it that often, so I didn't actually know that, but that's, that's pretty, yeah. that's pretty, that sounds pretty severe, but Reddit goes down like Twitter Google has like there's hiccups. People know that software is glitchy as hell. You know, you know, phones reboot. I know that's not websites, but phones reboot. Mm -hmm. uh, there's like weird problems with phones. People know that stuff is, is is strange and glitchy. Voice assistants will react differently to the same command if you say it three times. <laughs> you know, it's just it's just one of those things. Uh, like people know it's quirky, but if you do your due diligence, I mean, and put and do it, like 
Like, like what else is there to do at that point? And I, I, I'm a worrier. I worry about a lot of stuff. Mm. But, but if I've done everything I can, it's just like, well, I don't know. I'm going to press upload. <laughs> like, yep. and uh, upload and overwrite. Like, I don't, I don't care after I've, after I've done my due diligence. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Uh, I don't know if you had anything else to add to that, Mike, but I think uh, I think we're kind of hitting the end of the show here. Yeah, I think we can conclude. Alrighty, well, thanks for listening, everybody. You can find us on all of the so or most of the social. You can find us on, on social via a- at HTML all the things on Instagram and Facebook. You can find us on Twitter via at HTML everything. We're also on Medium and GitHub, and all these links will be in the show notes. Feel free to leave a comment or review on the platform you're listening to this on. We are signing off.